District Attorney Andrew Wiley is with us now. Thanks for joining us. Oh, appreciate you. you being here. David Sweat had another 14 years tacked onto his life sentence this past week? Yes, it was. Um, Judge McGill imposed the maximum sentences um, that he could impose by law, two um, three-and-a-half to seven-year sentences on the felonies, um, impose those consecutive to each other and consecutive to the life without parole sentence that he's serving. But, yes, it's uh, another uh, uh, seven to 14 years. Were you satisfied with the sentence? Do you wish it could have been longer? Well, it's, it's an interesting aspect when um, the defendant's already serving a life without parole sentence. I think what it does is, um, and what I was satisfied with from it, is that it sent this message. It sent the message that um, this type of crime will be prosecuted, at least here in Clinton County, and that the courts are willing to impose a maximum sentence allowable by law. Um, do I think that a, um, the New York State penal law needs to be modified relative to uh, this type of an offense and the sentences that could be imposed on it? Yes, I don't think a three and a half to seven year sentence for somebody um, escaping, serving a, you know, a conviction on an A felony or even a B felony um, is justified at, you know, three and a half to seven years. You would like to see it longer? Harsher, yes. For those that wonder why go to the trouble of prosecuting him if he's already serving a life sentence without any possibility of parole. What do you and, say to him? And what it comes down to really, Tom, is, is the, the aspect of um, showing that the cases will be, will be prosecuted. Now, understandably, um, people look at it and say, yes, the expense of a prosecution, he's serving life without parole. What can we do to him? Well, the one thing that we can do, um, or what this conviction um, uh, assists at least uh, us with, and the Department of Corrections is their ability to uh, place them in into special housing. Um, it's my understanding Department of Corrections are going to, at least at this point in time, have him serve the next six years in special housing. So, so in that sense, I think it, it solidifies that. But, um, uh, you know, will pe would people be asking me that question if um, while he was out, he committed a murder, he committed some type of a an assault, he committed some other type of a, you know, a violent crime, um, would, would people be questioning us about prosecuting him at that point in time? Or if he wasn't serving life without parole, you know, would people say, why are you prosecuting him if he's serving 25 years of life? Um, you know, it's, 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 it's a crime that was committed, a very, um, uh, you know, could have been a very violent crime. Uh, the result of it, uh, thank God, uh, nobody was injured. Um, no, you know, uh, values of, of people's homes or vehicles were stolen or destroyed. Um, yes, the state has incurred a, a terrible uh, expense, but um, uh, that's the position that I, I took from really from day one, um, knowing who we were dealing with, and um, uh, took that position that we needed to prosecute both Sweat and Matt if he was uh, taken alive. And to pick up on that point, do you feel fortunate? Do you think people should feel fortunate that that no one was killed, that that they they didn't in the process of the escape or while they were on the run yeah, definitely. kill somebody? Um, I think we we all um, feel fortunate uh, of that, and and we should because these were two violent men, um, both convicted of very violent crimes, and that uh, they had been incarcerated, you know, for a lengthy period of time prior to escaping. Um, and neither of them wanted to probably go back to the, uh, prison. And so they would have taken any measures that they probably needed to. Um, certainly, you know, we're well aware that David Sweat cooperated with the New York State Police, the Inspector General's office, the federal authorities when he was interviewed in those days following his capture um, by Sergeant Cook. But, um, you know, he he provided information relative to, you know, the days that they were, they were um, traveling through the woods in, in Clinton County and Franklin County, um, trying to avoid uh, being taken into custody by the police. And uh, Sweat, to some extent, you know, glorified the, their situation. And, and I, I think he, you know, at his sentencing, his lawyer mentioned um, statements that he you know, prevented Matt from uh, harming uh, any individuals, mm -hmm. um, prevented uh, the two of them from, you know, committing any other crimes other than uh, breaking into these camps to, to um, hide themselves. Um, so, um, 
you know, he cooperated uh, with law enforcement uh, right from the beginning when he was taken into custody through the time period that we uh, completed interviewing him. Um, so, you know, I, to what grain of or what level we take those statements to, um, you know, that has to be that has to be analyzed. But um, it's certainly the the danger that was out there um, and what they could have done if, if they were um, uh, confronted, you know, by law enforcement or by other civilians, um, you know, what what could have taken place. We don't know, and thank God nothing happened. His lawyer did say that he prevented uh, Matt from killing, that he had a shotgun pointed right. right at a law enforcement officer. You have no way of verifying that, but did, did you take that into account? Do you believe him, and did you take that into account when it came to sentencing? Well, um, the question of whether I believe him or not is, is really something I, I shouldn't comment on. Um, but the, and I didn't take that into account. Um, it was my position that, you know, he needed to have the maximum sentence that could be Im imposed against him. Uh, at sentencing, he apologized, um, uh, you know, to um, the community, um, to the state, and to the country for what, uh, you know, he caused and what, what Matt had caused. But I, I, um, you know, and I think Judge McGillen imposing the, the maximum sentence that he could, knowing that he's serving life without parole sentence, um, you know, didn't take it, you know, um, didn't accept that apology or, or accept those statements he made. But I think it was just this is what, what had to be done. Um, so whether he was sincere, it, he certainly may have been. Um, he was now in custody and he, he was no longer able to, um, you know, harm anyone um, in that sense. But, um, you know, so I think that's the position at least that I took and, and um, I, I'm not gonna speak for Judge McGill on, on what his thought process was for sentencing, but, um, you know, that's what I took from it. You talked about, you talk about the, the apology, saying he was sorry for the fear that he caused. Did you get a sense that he was being sin sincere and remorseful in, in court that day? Um, I did not, I did not walk away from that proceeding thinking that but he's certainly entitled to his comments and his opinion and and that is certainly what he at least was portraying um, at the sentencing proceeding uh, the um, restitution right. issue uh, he will have to pay back about eighty thousand dollars that was right. part of the sentencing uh, as well uh, a lot of people wonder how he's ever going to be able to do that and so why would you uh, fight for the restitution if it appears unlikely that he's ever going to be able to repay it. Well, he, he, may, ne he may never be able to repay it. He's obviously ordered to pay it jointly and severally with Joyce Mitchell. Um, and Gene Palmer would not be a, a part of that because there's um, no indication based on the investigation that Palmer, um, uh, you know, knew there were hacksaw blades in, the, in that hamburger meat. But, um, as far as his ability to pay restitution today, he has no ability to pay that. Um, down the road, whether he does have an abil ability to pay it, whether it's through some uh, financial um, uh, resource that he receives or family members receive, um, uh, that's you know something that's to be determined. But that was one of the reasons why I wanted to go forward with this prosecution as well. Getting a conviction on him if he were two down the road receive some type of uh, monetary benefit that we would be able to um, uh, assess the order against him and uh, receive restitution for the state. Um, it's you know, one of the other main factors I had in, in prosecuting him. If he ever got a book deal or if any media right. ever offered to pay for right. interviews? I, you know, I've made those, those comments uh, fairly consistently um, throughout this and, and if that were to occur, um, you know, whether the law would allow that or not, but whether that would, that would occur, we would have that, that opportunity then to um, uh, have the Attorney General of the state um, execute the order against him and, and receive restitution. At his sentencing, he did try to withdraw his guilty plea. Well, um, there was an issue that he brought up um, in chambers before we went um, on the record. Uh, in the courtroom and uh, so that issue was resolved in chambers and um, because it was resolved in chambers um, I wanted to at least have it acknowledged on the record uh, in court whether uh, he was going to continue with that um, 
application to withdraw his plea. And uh, as we all know now, he withdrew that, um, that application. So um, the details of it is not something I feel appropriate to, to discuss, though. He made statements saying that he had endured abusive conditions at Dannemora, and that was why he escaped. He was getting away from, from those abusive conditions. Was that the first you had ever heard of that as a possible motive for the that breakout? Was, that was the first time that, that we um, heard that issue raised. Um, he had made statements to the law enforcement officers following his apprehension that um, there were false ac accusations made against him relative to his conduct with uh, civilian employees. And um, that was one of the reasons when he says that Richard Matt approached him about escaping, that he decided, you know, um, this is the way I'm being treated in the facility. These accusations are being made against me. If we can find a, a route out of the facility to escape, then um, you know he would join Matt in doing that. You mentioned that he d has been cooperating with state police and the inspector general's investigation right. into into the into the break. Um, uh, if uh, early on you had mentioned that you th thought that he had used power tools to, to break out, that it would have been impossible just to use the hacksaw blades. Has he stuck to that story that he and Matt only used the hacksaw blades? Yes, that's very consistent throughout um, his statements to law enforcement. And it's consistent with the evidence that was actually found um, during the investigation by the New York State Police and the um, uh, forensic uh, unit um, following the days of the escape, um, multiple uh, hacksaw blades wrapped up in, in um, cloth and uh, rubber bands or tape um, were found um, in various locations, uh, specifically in the area of the, of the tunnel, um, uh, the pipe, you know, the pipe that was cut uh, both on the inside and the outside of the, of the wall. And so that was, that was very consistent with the statements that he made and, and I think verified um, to law enforcement uh, and to myself that uh, those were the tools that were used um, for the escape. He filled in a lot of blanks about when, how they planned it, right. how they carried it out, what they did after they got outside the prison walls. Was there anything that he hasn't answered that still is nagging you? If, if you could ask him one question to clarify something, what would it be? I, I really don't have that one question, uh, Tom, to ask. I think. All of the, the details that I was concerned about uh, throughout the investigation um, have either been, um, you know, resolved through the investigation or have been resolved um, through the interviews with Sweat and confirmed um, with the evidence that um, was either, um, you know, secured at the facility or, or since uh, the breakout. Are you still convinced that other than Joyce Mitchell and the two inmates, nobody else knew about this? breakout. Nobody else helped with the planning or helped carry it out. Right. I have no information as I sit here that any other individuals were involved in that aspect uh, of the prison break. Gene Palmer, that case is still pending. Uh, he has yeah. been charged with, with the smuggling the uh, hacksaw blades and some tools into the two inmates, but you don't believe that he was aware that uh, that's what he was doing? Well, he's He's been charged with um, bringing the hamburger meat, the frozen hamburger, hamburger meat, into the facility uh, as a result of receiving it from Joyce Mitchell, bringing that hamburger meat to Richard Matt. He had a polygraph test. Uh, he passed the polygraph test according to the New York State Police investigators, and during that polygraph test, he was asked specific questions about his knowledge of the hamburger meat. Um, containing the hacksaw blades and he um, in his responses uh, was at the affirmative that he had no knowledge that the hacksaw blades were in the hamburger meat. Some of the other smaller tools though uh, is, right. is what uh, is the issue that, right. that he and assisted. Those are tools in. that he actually admitted that he provided to both Matt and Sweat. If convicted, should he go to prison? That's up to the judge. The inspector general has been doing an investigation since last summer now. Correct. Any indication from her or her office uh, what they have found or when they're going to be releasing their findings? Well, I think the release of the report would be post um, Palmer's disposition. So once his matter is resolved, um, 
I, I anticipate that the Inspector General will, will complete and then uh, issue her report. Um, as far as any other additional information, um, I do not have the details uh, of that. And um, when she feels it's appropriate to, to release that information, I'm sure I'll uh, sit down with her and we'll discuss that. If she found or finds criminal wrongdoing, right. then would you prosecute that? Would she come to you with, with additional yeah. cases to she prosecute? Would, she would pre present that information to my office for review, um, obviously as long as it dealt with issues that occurred in Clinton County. And if we felt it was appropriate and justified to proceed with a criminal prosecution, we would work with the Inspector General, we would work with the New York State Police and proceed in that manner. But that hasn't happened. Correct. Last question. Sure. Uh, obviously, this was a national story. Right. You were thrust into the national spotlight for at least a few weeks. Right. Looking back yeah. now, uh, over all those months and this unfolding, what, what, are, your, what are your thoughts? Uh, uh, almost, not quite a year later, but nine, eight, nine months later, right. as you slowly work these cases through the courts and, and get this resolved. Well, as far as um, uh, it brought Clinton County, uh, on the map nationally, um, internationally. Um, I've talked with many people that, uh, you know, were on vacation during June of last year, seeing this story break and talking to the people um, about, about the uh, prison break. When I um, uh, continue to speak with people throughout the country on various other matters that I have, um, and they ask where I'm from, I. I bring up the issue and they're like, yeah, we, you know, we saw that all, all last summer. Um, it certainly brought a new perspective um, to me on um, dealing with um, the media locally, uh, nationally, in, in the sense that we obviously had never experienced something of this nature. Uh, the Clinton County District Attorney's Office had never um, experienced this type of um, publicity, um, recognition, and, and so um, in the sense that, you know, the way I, I think I was able to handle um, the media, handle the, the exposure that we received, uh, I'm, I'm proud of the way uh, my office handled that. Um, and, uh, you know, if something of this nature were to occur um, in the future, we'd certainly be, you know, more prepared to, to deal with um, the onslaught of um, national media resources that that certainly came into our community. Biggest event of your career? In the sense of, of that, um, you know, with, with dealing with the national media, I, I certainly, you know, as the case in and of itself, I, I would not say it's the, the biggest case that I've ever dealt with. Um, we all know, you know, we've had um, uh, some very serious high-profile cases here in Clinton County in the last um, 10 years since I took office. You know, I walked in on a, on a double homicide um, back in 2006. Um, and and I would say case. the Dashna case. And, um, you know, I would say that's probably the biggest impact case that, that I've had to deal with um, in my career as a prosecutor. Um, but um, the amount of time, uh, attention that this case took for that you know, that 28 or so days, or 23 days, I guess, from the 6th to the 28th um, was incredible. And, um, Longest you know, 23 days of your, of your life? Was, yeah, it probably was. So. Okay. Anything I didn't ask you that you want to no. add? No. We're good. All right. Good. All right. Thank you. Thank you.